My name is Tim Stead. I'm from WebSense. I'm one of the security engineers at WebSense. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the changing threat landscape and how we need a, a new response to that changing landscape. So if we look at the, the changing threat landscape in a little bit of detail and look at ultimately the why. What, what is the motivation here? What has been the motivation? And really motivation is key. And motivation has been uh, in the past uh, one of really uh, to annoy, to cause a nuisance. Um, nothing much more than that. So if we actually look at who perhaps the perpetrators were in these situations, it's often just simply petty criminals, uh, what we regard as the, the script kitty, uh, those sort of uh, attackers that were really out there just to sort of gain kudos with their, uh, with their peers. Uh, and ultimately the, the, their motivations were uh, one to impress um, their peers, um, in some cases to, uh, to disrupt business. And we saw a little bit of uh, perhaps data theft occurring in these situations as well. There was perhaps the, the, some instances of, of um, petty criminals, even a little bit of organized crime. Uh, but really the data theft was um, limited to simple things such as credit card numbers, perhaps a little bit of personal information, maybe all people's uh, tax records. Um, you know, and, and, and what it ultimately accounted for was uh, there was profit to be made here, but it was um, relatively small. Now, if we look at where we are today, the last few years has seen a tremendous change in this area, and it's really been driven by, by that, that profit thing. It's, it's money that, that's um, uh, the motivation here. And so now we see that what's really being targeted is intellectual property. Um, it's customer lists, it's pricing information, it's merger and acquisition information. It's the sort of data that can actually move markets. Um, this is, uh, uh, means that the, the perpetrators in this case, the criminals, are much more organized and there's also nation states that are getting involved and we hear about this all the time. Now they're not, nation states are not necessarily simply attacking each other. They're also uh, going after a lot of the organizations, um, uh, it's certainly in capitalist economies. So a really good example of this, um, a recent one, is probably Coca-Cola. So in around March 2009, uh, the FBI came knocking on Coca-Cola's door and said, you know, we've seen some evidence that you've been the target of um, Chinese hackers. On further investigation, what they then found out was that um, uh, it had actually been quite a few months that Coca-Cola systems had been infiltrated, key executives have been targeted, in particular uh, the, their deputy president for the uh, Asia-Pac region. And really what was, uh, what was going on here was, was the theft of, of key data. Three days after the FBI came knocking, the $2.4 billion merger failed. Now, this would have actually been the largest takeover of a Chinese organization by a foreign entity. So then when we consider what the motivation was in this case, uh, there's a, a, a very strong potential political motivation here. Now, no one really knows why these hackers did what they did. What we do know is that Coke were involved in this takeover. Um, and Three days after the FBI informed them of this, the, the, the takeover failed. Um, so there is a, a, obviously a, a very obvious link. Now, Coke aren't the, uh, the only ones to have suffered this sort of issue. And in fact, one of the, the interesting things about this was that they never actually disclosed this information until last year. Um, which is not an uncommon thing either. Lots of organizations are very, very hesitant to disclose this sort of information. And it looks like uh, that certainly the, uh, the various financial markets and investors are very, very interested in this information. And we can understand why. This is, uh, this is key to the success of a company. The ability to perform a takeover or, or fail is, is, is obviously a, a very key point. So you can understand why some companies want to keep this secret. You can also, also understand why investors are very, very interested in this information. Uh, and currently the debate is whether or not such things should actually be disclosed to, sto uh, disclosed to stock markets. 
Another example is a, a local energy firm from the US, Chesapeake Energy. Chesapeake Energy had uh, sensitive information on the leases of gas fields um, that they owned stolen. You know, sort of the information that you can understand is very, very uh, important, not just to them, but also to their competitors. Uh, perhaps very important to anyone looking to try and make a profit from this. So we can see that the motivations have changed significantly over the last few years, and it's really one that's been driven by profit. So that's a lot of the why. Why are these new modern attacks taking place? Why has the, the threat landscape changed the way it has? Now a lot of the question is how? How are they actually doing this? And one of the ways is that they're exploiting blind spots. Now there are lots of blind spots in, in most organizations' networks. They're very common. The best analogy that I use in this scenario is, is to think of uh, the differences between a cat burglar and a bank robber. A bank robber runs in all guns blazing. He's pretty obvious, he's shooting up. A cat burglar is someone that moves around very stealthy, undetected, takes his time. We see the same thing happening with, with cyber attacks. Modern malware now is very, very stealthy, very smart, it's very good at hiding itself. Now one of the key ways that attackers hide these things is SSL. SSL is extremely important from the perspective of a blind spot and it's something that organizations seriously need to consider how they monitor um, the goings on with inside SSL traffic. At WebSense we did a survey of the Fortune 1000 companies and we actually found that uh, only 12% were doing uh, what we call SSL interception, that is um, using a man in the middle technique to look inside SSL traffic and actually look for bad things inside. So when we consider that 30% of a, an organization's web traffic, for example, is SSL, that's a, that's a huge blind spot to have, that's a significant amount of traffic to not be looking at. And it's also often the most critical. The other thing about SSL is that it's predicted to grow to around 50% in the next few years by 2015. So, you know, this is a key area that we need to be looking at. And also then if we then consider how we've tried to mitigate this issue up until now, things like DLP, for example. Lots of organizations have implemented DLP, particularly for the web channel. However, not an awful lot of them are looking inside SSL because they don't actually have the ability to which renders those DLP solutions almost useless. The same goes for some of our new um, advanced malware detection techniques. You know, there's, there's solutions out there now that point products specifically aimed at combating advanced malware, discovering unknown malware, and we know roughly what, what, sort of, what these technologies look like. However, one of the key issues that they have is very often they're deployed into the network through some sort of spam port, network tap, and they, they monitor all of the uh, traffic that they see going out of the network, and they light up when they see a brand new piece of malware, for example. And what we actually see from that is that that's typically around 95% 95 of the, the bad stuff that's on that network. However, it's that 5% that they're not looking at, or that they can't see because it's encrypted within SSL. That's the 5% that's actually lethal. So even these new point products that a lot of organizations are now looking to utilize are proving to be useless because they still have the, the same issue with these blind spots. So let's look into, uh, perhaps look into some of these um, uh, changes that we've seen in the threat landscape in a little bit more detail. Advanced threats is one thing to, to talk about. Now the threat has advanced quite significantly and attacks have got a lot more sophisticated. Uh, what we see today is very different to what we had perhaps four or five years ago. Uh, attacks are, are, are usually uh, a lot less widespread, they're low volume, uh, they are much more targeted to, to specific individuals and organizations. One of the issues that this has caused is that for a lot of security organizations that are trying to defend against such attacks, they don't see these attacks taking place. We don't see the, the mass mailing worms that we had a few years ago. We don't see the, uh, the, the huge um, phishing attacks. 
Uh, these sort of attacks now are much more targeted. Spear phishing, for example, they target uh, uh, maybe five or ten users, not a hundred thousand at one time. Uh, the same goes with the malware. A lot of malware is, is specifically written for, for a, a particular attack. It's not launched against hundreds of thousands of people all at once. What this means for the security organizations that are trying to defend against these attacks is that they don't see uh, them until it's too late. And the, the, the way we've responded in the past has been to use mechanisms such as signatures and reputation. Well, these things have ultimately become useless as well because an awful lot of attacks now move so fast. A lot of malware is, is almost brand new or, or nearly new uh, or takes advantage of vulnerabilities that are nearly new, what we call zero days. So these have proved very, very difficult as well for us to defend against, but this is, this is something that we're seeing in the evolution of the threat landscape as well. The other uh, big area has obviously been uh, what, uh, what the attack is actually targeting. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's much less around causing a, a nuisance within a, a, a network or um, damage to systems. Now what the attackers are actually looking for is to steal data. So this has been a big area of evolution. Consequently, uh, a lot of our systems in the past have really been around focusing on the inbound. Let's keep the bad stuff out, stop it from getting into our network. However, the game has changed. And what we're finding now is that you can no longer take the, the position of, I have nothing in my network that's, that's infiltrated or infected me. Organizations are now saying, you know what, the chances are I probably am infected. I need to find a way to ensure that my data doesn't get out. Containment has become the new game. Ultimately, management of security systems is also something that needs to change. We can no longer take the position of, I buy a security point product, I drop it into my network, a firewall, antivirus, a URL filter, and I leave these things to protect me. That's not going to work anymore. There needs to be a more proactive approach. Uh, organizations are going to have to monitor these systems. They need to know, they need to get alerts. They need to be told when potentially um, SSL is being used in their network for, for, for uh, ill-gotten gains, for bad things. They need to be told when there's obfuscation taking place that's trying to hide data leaking out. Uh, they need to get alerts on this thing so that they can respond accordingly. They need to take a more holistic view of what is actually going on in the environment and not just rely on an IPS system uh, intrusion prevention system blocking uh, a known attack. So if we consider those changes that we've seen in the threat landscape, uh, and if we bring those together with the seven stages of an attack, um, now these are seven key stages that WebSense have identified are, uh, are quite common to modern attacks. Um, what that gives us is that very easily we can, we can define a set of requirements that we actually need for our security defenses going forward. For example, we need the ability to understand and analyze advanced threats. We need to be able to detect them. We need to be able to do that without relying on the, the typical mechanisms that we've used in the past. We also need to be able to contain the threat. So we need to be able to contain data that's potentially leaking out of our organization. This is critical. We need the ability to respond to such threats. We need a threat dashboard, if you will, which will give us this key information, uh, provide us with alerts where necessary so that we can respond accordingly. And we need the ability to drill into the forensics of such alerts so that we can actually see, OK, where a, a key piece of information has been leaked out of the network, what was it? Uh, based on that, uh, I can actually you know, have a, a certain severity defined. Uh, if it's the keys to the kingdom that have been leaked out of my network, then my action plan could be a lot more serious uh, than if it's just a, a particular individual's credit card number, for example. But obviously with all of these new security requirements, uh, we're going to pay a price. The ability to do this advanced threat analysis, to, to do this containment of, 
of data that may be uh, leaking out of an organization. Uh, it, it doesn't come for nothing. Uh, it's going to require uh, additional systems, additional processing. And what we need to be sh careful of here, what we need to ensure is that we don't disable our users, we don't disable the network. So performance and availability is a, a key requirement uh, for this as well. So why is it that our existing security technologies fail to deliver? Why aren't they protecting us against this new advanced threat landscape? It's really that they were built for a different era. The first reason is these techniques are primarily based on signature and reputation. So they're a reactive model. Uh, also what we call the sacrificial lamb model. Which means that we need to see perhaps uh, a few thousand, a hundred thousand people get infected first before we actually know of the threat and can respond to it. For example, antivirus, which we've had as a, a security defense technique for many years now, is signature based. It's reliant on, I've seen this piece of malware before, this virus before, I write a signature for it, I put it in my database, and I send that to all my users. Now these things don't happen instantly. That sort of analysis takes place back in a lab in Cupertino or Mountain View or somewhere in California. And it's then pushed out to customers. These things can take days to happen. The same with reputation. Reputation is a reactive mechanism. I've seen these, these bad servers on the internet spewing out malware or delivering other threats. Therefore, I add them to my reputation list to block them. The second key reason is the lack of real-time content analysis. A lot of this analysis that we've done using our security technologies up until now, as I mentioned, is a reactive mechanism. But it's a background process, which means that uh, samples are collected, URLs, files, for example, and they're uploaded to systems uh, in California or wherever, where they're then processed by security companies. But this is something that takes place over a matter of days. It's not real time. The threats are moving so fast now that we actually need this to be done in real time as the users are accessing the content and inline as well. That's really critical to this process too. The third area is one that I mentioned earlier as well. Uh, a lot of our security technologies have really been only interested in the inbound. Uh, they don't look at what's actually going outbound. So they've really been about, well, let's try and keep the bad stuff out. Let's put up the castle walls and, and attempt to, to block things coming in through our gateway. There has been no consideration as to what's actually going out. You know what, I'm probably already infected. Uh, how do I actually contain that threat from leaking my data out? The ability to look at types of encryption, uh, obfuscation techniques, these sort of things are critical to that outbound facing protection. Uh, SSL, which we already mentioned, the ability to look inside SSL is a key component of this. But also what you're looking for, the data, is there sensitive data that is, in, is being uploaded through that outbound connection? The keys to the kingdom, you know, one of the important pieces of a, a modern attack that we see taking place is the elevation of privileges. The, the stealing of password files and SAM databases is ultimately what gives an attacker uh, much greater scope to uh, expand a, his attack and, and, and steal that critical information, that, that uh, necessary information. And this is done by, as I mentioned, stealing password files and these other sort of credentials. So the ability to look at that as part of this outbound facing protection is, is really quite key as well. The fourth area that where legacy technologies have been failing has been really one of a new approach, and that's been an approach of consolidation. Now, consolidation is good, especially from the perspective of availability and operational performance. How do we actually manage all of these new systems, these new security technologies that we need? How do we manage them without creating uh, such a, a massive overhead on our, our operational resources and our staff? So the fourth area has some merit, the idea of consolidating security technologies to make that easier. However, the approach that we've seen up until now, which has been uh, technologies such as UTM firewalls, next generation firewalls, it's the wrong sort of consolidation. The problem is that these technologies have really just been 
reusing uh, some of the, the traditional security mechanisms that we've had up until now. Signatures, reputation, you know, they're not really looking any deeper into the problem. They're not using real-time analysis. They're not using the outbound protection. They're just regurgitating uh, some of the, the, the failures that we've had up until now. So in our next video, what we'll be discussing is the actual the seven layers of an attack that we typically see used, uh, and we'll actually compare those with a, a real-world example. Um, so we'll go through that in detail, analyze that attack, and then we'll look at how uh, we can use some new approaches, uh, some new security defense technologies to, to try and address these issues. <laughs>